Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted more love, joy, and success in your life, then do we have the Servant Leadership in Action show for you. Today I'll be talking with Ken Blanchard, one of the most influential leadership experts in the world, the co-author of The New One Minute Manager, and more than 60 other books with over 21 million books sold in 42 languages. In 2005, Ken was inducted into Amazon's Hall of Fame as one of the top 25 best-selling authors of all time. And he is the co-editor of a brilliant new book on leading from the heart, Servant Leadership in Action. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how you can achieve great relationships and results by leading out of love. That, plus we'll talk about fishers of men, Disney and happiness, riverbanks and puddles, quacking like ducks, what we can all learn from the garbage man, and what in the world leaky cabinets and WD-40 have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Ken. Are you ready to shine? Absolutely. Aren't we supposed to be the light of the world? <laughs> Each and every one of us gets to be ambassador of smile in my book. That's right. So going from there, before we dive right into things, what's a chief spiritual officer? Well, I, uh, Margie, my wife and I started our company uh, in uh, 1979, and mm -hmm. I was she was the president. She's much better at running things. And I was officially the chairman, and I just didn't like that title. And I was having lunch with Max Dupree one time, the legendary chairman of Herman Miller, wrote a wonderful book, uh, The Soul of a Firm. And mm -hmm. I said, what's your job as the chairman of this great company? And he said, I have to be like a third grade teacher. I have to uh, you know, say the vision and values over and over and over again so people get it right, right, right. And I thought, wow, that's really something. I ought to be doing that. And I decided I didn't like to be called chairman, so I was going to be the chief spiritual officer. And I leave a message for everybody in our company every day. I <clears throat> do three things, Michael. One, yeah. people tell me who's hurting. And so I ask everybody in our company to pray for people and send their love and all. And having over 300 people doing that, we got a lot of data on the power of prayer. And secondly, I praise people. Michael, of all the things I've taught over the years, if somebody said, Blanchard, I'm taking everything away, what one thing, what would you hold on to? I think the second secret of the one-minute manager about catching people doing things right and accenting the positive, which I know you're a believer in. And then finally, I leave an inspirational message on something I've read or some message I've gotten. I got a message a while back from a guy from New Zealand I had met in an airport, and I sent him a couple of books. And he sent me an email. He said, Ken, you know, the business you're in is teaching people the power of love rather than love of power. And so I made a morning message on that. <laughs> Woohoo! What, what I like so much about this, not only is this incredibly empowering for other people, but because you do this on a regular basis, you have to go hunting with your mind. And so your mind has been rewired for happiness, for looking for the positive every place you can. Yes, it's really important. And I think it keeps me learning and thinking, you know, I've always said that if you stop learning, you ought to lie down and let them throw the dirt on you, you know, because uh, you're dead anyway. <laughs> oh, no. So, so if we go, we'll segue from there back to your earliest days. And because, because you have a very unique take, you've seen way outside the paradigm. What was your life like in your earliest years growing up? Well, I was very fortunate. I had two fabulous parents. My dad retired as an admiral in the Navy, and he was really kind of my hero, an amazing guy who grew up at West Point. His father was a doctor there. And when he yep. got out of Highland Falls High School, his dad said, son, I think you should go away to school. And my father loved West Point, and so he wanted to go there. And he said, father said, no, you need to go somewhere else. He said, if I can't go there, I'll go to Annapolis. And so he went to Annapolis and graduated in 24. They didn't think they'd need naval officers in 24 because we had finished World War One and 22, and they thought we had fought the war to end all wars. And so they released him after his senior cruise, and he ended Harvard Business School and majored in finance, went down to Wall Street and, and started with Anaconda Copper. And then he was building a career at the National City Bank, and they were about to make him a, a vice president. And he came home in 1940. I was one year old. He said to my mom, well, I quit today. She said, you quit? He said... She said, to do what? He said, I rejoined the Navy. She said, you got to be kidding me. He said, 
Well, didn't I tell you when we got married, if the country ever got in trouble, I thought I owed it something. Hitler's nuts. And be just a little time till the Japanese will be in this. And so here's one of those great Americans. He quits a vice presidency opportunity, goes back as a second Louis. They put him in Brooklyn Navy Yard. Pearl Harbor happens in 81. Looks like he's going to stay there. He's got no experience. So uh, that wasn't my father's style. So he called a classmate who had stayed in and was the top guy in the Bureau of Personnel in Marston. Mm -hmm. He said, John, what do you got for an old fart with no experience? I got to get in the action. He said, let me check, Ted. And so he called back a few days later. He said, Ted, all I got for a guy with your experience is a suicide group going into the Marshall Islands. And so my father said, you got your man. Didn't tell my mother. Oh they my gave, him 12 L gave him 12 LCIs, these landing craft infantry. Uh, and their job was to protect the Marines and the frogmen, who are the SEALs today, going into Saipan, Kowajalain, Anahuitak, Tinian. 70, 75% of his men were killed or wounded. I got a picture of me at five years old with a sailor suit saluting my father coming home because he had been gone for several years. You couldn't commute those. And he was just an amazing human being. And, and uh, just, you know, I'm probably talking too much, but I won the president of the seventh grade in junior high school. <laughs> I lived outside of New Rochelle and I came home. I'm all proud. And I said, Dad, I'm the president of the seventh grade. And my dad smiled. And he said, your leadership training starts now. He said, Ken, now that you're president, don't ever use your position. He said, great leaders are great because people trust and respect them, not because they have power. He said, the greatest leaders are people who have power but don't use it. And uh, it was just amazing. Uh, they would have a reunion of all his executive officers from his 12 ships who were still alive every year. And they would just come and tell me as a kid, boy, you're dead. Uh, he was the best officer I ever had, you know. And, and uh, so he was just a great influence on me and almost got, got me interested in leadership because I had a lot of chances uh, in uh, junior high school and high school to, to lead. So it was that was really kind of my beginning, uh, Michael. An important thank you for sharing. No, you, that was perfect. That was beautiful. One of the words that comes to mind when I think about your dad that also comes to mind when I think about each one of the servant leaders in your book is values. Yes, yes. And my my father said, "Can always your number one value, you know, has got to be integrity." He said, "When all is said and gone, that's what." what people look for, you know, can they trust your word, you know, so he was always great on, on uh, that. And he was interesting, Michael, he retired early as a captain, he could have stayed in, but they bumped him up because they had a legislative law because he had the silver star, which is one rank below the Medal of Honor. And, and uh, I said, Dad, why did you retire early? You could have been an admiral on your own terms. He said, Ken, I hate to say it, but I like the wartime Navy better than peacetime. Not that I like to fight, but he said, in wartime, we were clear on what we were trying to do and what we were trying to accomplish. And the problem with peacetime is nobody knows what we're supposed to be doing. As a result, and I'll never forget this, he said, there's too many people who are in leadership as this and who think their full-time job is making other people feel unimportant. And he just hated bureaucracies and those kinds of uh, things and he felt in peacetime it became a bureaucracy. So and that goes right right to the heart of servant leadership. And we'll 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 I want to hear more about your story. So I'm going to bring it back full around. But the importance of a clear mission and objective and values. Did you have a clear mission from seventh grade forward where you were going? Well, you know, I thought that uh, you know I was wanted to go to college and all, and and uh, when I got there. Uh, as a student leader and all that, I thought I wanted to be in student personnel. I wanted to be a dean of students, you know, and all that kind of thing. And and uh, so uh, I uh, ended up going to Colgate to get a master's degree in sociology, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and study. Uh, but it was a, it was in a school of education, and it was such boring course, courses I couldn't stand it. So I switched. Uh, you know, my major, and that's how I got into sociology. You know, I, a wonderful professor there that I met uh, took me in. And, and so uh, I just was uh, saying, OK, you know, uh, I, I'm going to see what else I can do, you know. Uh, and I ended up, you know, my first job, I was assistant to the dean of the business school at Ohio University mm -hmm. uh, after I got my doctor's degree. And, 
And when I got there, he said, Ken, I think you should teach a course. You know, I want all my deans to teach. I hadn't thought much about teaching. You know, I wanted to be a leader and all this kind of thing. And so, no, he said, I want you to teach. And I had done my doctoral dissertation on Fred Fiedler. And he was one of the first situational leadership theorists. And so I met Paul Hersey, who had come in as chairman of the department. And we ended up writing a textbook uh, together. I had never thought I'd be writing a textbook, you know, and so I came to the dean and I said, I quit as an administrator. I'm going to be a faculty member. I got a book coming out. <laughs> and he laughed. He said, you can't quit. He said, I said, why not? He said, because I was going to fire you because you're a lousy administrator, oh, no. which I was. <laughs> and uh, so we, we agreed it was a photo finish, you know. Uh, uh, and so I ended up uh, as a faculty member for 10 years and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and teaching leadership and organizational behavior and and uh, then Margie and I came on a one-year sabbatical leave to San Diego uh, 41 years ago. <laughs> we just never went back to Massachusetts. I know you're from that area. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty long sabbatical, particularly it for was, a one-year yeah. one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> People couldn't believe I gave up a full professor with tenure. Uh, to start by our own company, you know. But uh, again, I wasn't a big fan of bureaucracies. How were you? How are you um, motivated or inspired to write the One Minute Manager? Well, you know, life is what happens to you. I think, Michael, when you're planning on doing something else, you know. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we had written this textbook, and I was teaching, and all. Well, I had never thought about writing a quote popular book, and mm -hmm. but uh, a woman by the name of Adelaide Bree, who wrote uh, Visualizations, directing the movies of your mind, the first per, one of the first people on curing yourself of cancer, had a party in San Diego for authors. And somehow I qualified because I had this textbook. And Spencer Johnson was there and he wrote children's books, you know, the Value Tales series with his wife, Value, value of a Sense of Humor, the story of Will Rogers and the value of integrity, you know, the story of Helen Keller. And, you know, and so uh, my wife, Margie, met him first and hand carried him over to me. And she said, you ought to write a children's book together on management because managers won't read anything else. <laughs> it's too long. And so uh, I invited him to a seminar. and He was working on a one minute scolding with a psychiatrist on how to discipline kids. And he came to my seminar and he sat in the back and laughed and came running up at the end. And he said, forget parenting. Let's do the one minute manager. <laughs> and so we met this uh, first week in November. We had a draft of the One Minute Manager completed by the time we were going to the Rose Bowl at the end of December because he was wow. a children's book writer and I'm a storyteller. We decided to write a parable and there hadn't been any management parables, you know, and so we wrote this parable and all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> the whole world came racing at it, you know. Woohoo! So yeah. Isn't that something, you know, you never plan on things. No, but you you were open and you went, you were open, you were radically listening, and you were willing to go with the flow. That's right, yeah. I think that's important, going with the flow. Yep. So, Don't get stuck. <laughs> from there, when did you start to see, because you've been working now with managers for a very long time, when did you start to see that the paradigm is completely broken? Well, it, it became pretty obvious uh, early to me. I, I had a wonderful opportunity when I was at Ohio University. I was asked to work with all the student leaders, you know, and the president of Ohio University was a good friend of Robert Greenleaf, and he had retired from AT&T, and, and he came for a weekend to work with the students, and Margie and I got to spend a weekend with with uh, Robert Greenleaf, of course, became the father of servant leadership and just an amazing guy because he had just watched what was going on in industry and all the push for profit and all that. And, and it was through dealing with him, I started to believe, uh, Michael, that uh, the number one customer you have to have in your organization is your people. If you take care of your people and train them and empower them and love on them, they're going to go out of their way to take care of your second most important customer, the people who use your products and services. And if they do that, they'll become raving fans of yours and they'll be part of your sales force. And that takes care of the people that are interested in profitability and results and all that kind of thing. Because one of the problems that I realized is that 
in Wall Street, they often act like the only reason to be in business is to make money. And I've decided, no, that profit is the applause you get for creating a motivating environment for your people so they can take care of your customers. And that was the beginning of my realizing we needed a different way to look at leadership. Woohoo! That is huge. It's also sustainable. It's also a, a better model for the world. And it helps to shift everything. Truly. Yeah, it really, really is necessary. You know, we need a different mindset because then we can train people on skill set. <laughs> I like it. So how did you get interested specifically in servant leadership? Well, it started with, you know, that weekend with Robert Greenleaf, you know, and uh, but the more I got to observe organizations and all, I, I saw a lot of self-serving leaders, you know, leaders who thought that all the brains were in their office and they wanted everybody sucking up the hierarchy, you know, and that's when I started to realize, you know, that as a customer, if you have a problem and you're dealing with a frontline person from a self-serving organization that protects the hierarchy, you're talking to a duck, you know, and they're going quack, 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 hits our policy, quack, quack, I just work here, quack, quack, I didn't make the rules, quack, 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 quack. And I first heard that duck analogy from Wayne Dyer years ago, you know, but it's so beautiful because everybody's sucking up the hierarchy. And uh, But I, then I found other organizations like Southwest Airlines. I got a chance to write a book with Colleen Barrett, who mm -hmm. took over as president when Herb stepped down. And you talk to their frontline people, they're eagles, you know. <laughs> They'll take care of it, you know, Nordstrom's, no problem. You know, and, and so I started to see the difference between organizations that see that when you talk about servant leadership, Michael, a lot of times people think you're talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please people and all. But they don't realize that there's two uh, aspects of servant leadership. One is vision, direction and values and goals. Mm -hmm. And that's the responsibility of the hierarchy. It doesn't mean you don't evolve people in it. But if people don't know what business you're in, where you're trying to go and what your values are going to drive your behavior, the goals, shame on you and all. So that's the leadership part of servant leadership. Once that's clear, now you philosophically turn that pyramid upside down and now that's the servant part of servant leadership. And now you're working for your people who work for your people who eventually work for the customer. And, and the, the self-serving organizations, they won't turn that beauty up because they want everybody sucking up the hierarchy. And that's where you get all the ducks versus the eagles. Well, it also has to do with leading out of love versus leading out of fear. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important thing. You know, the book I wrote with Colleen Barrett from Southwest was called Lead with Love. And love was spelled L-U-V because that's their stock symbol. And of course, they operate out of love lane, you know, out of initially out of love field and, and all that kind of thing. So a lot of people are a little uptight about talking about love and business, but we're talking about really caring about other human beings, both your people and your customers and your suppliers, because when all is said and done, uh, Michael, when you die, everything that you've accumulated of money and recognition and power and all that all goes back in the box. You know, the only thing you get to save, I think, is your soul. And that's where you store who you love and who loves you. The rest is always irrelevant to me. I, I was watching this morning in between reading a book. I was taking some time with the kitty cats while my wife is out of town. I get to do some, some extra kitty love. And, and I was watching a, a Jack Nicholson movie, uh, The Bucket List. Oh, yeah, that's a wonderful book. And, and he, at the end of it, he has been a ruthless lead with fear kind of guy. And it, I, was, I was amazed at the synchronicity of it dovetailing with this book so perfectly. But at yes. the end, he's there giving a eulogy for his good friend. And he's talking about, I loved this man. It had opened his heart and everything changed when his heart opened. Yes, it was just a wonderful. And, and a, what a great acting job, the two of them, wasn't it? Oh, my God. Absolutely. So when we talk about love, let's talk about being love guided to this book. How in the world did you get all of the all the people you did in this book? Well, you know, I think one of my strengths, Michael, is that I'm not competitive with other people. I I think that we're all here to help each other, you know. Thank you. And rather than being competitive, I love to build other people 
up and what they're doing and see what they're doing, how it connects to what I'm doing, and is there a way we can help each other? And so uh, I was able to get all of these amazing people to do this because they didn't see me as kind of trying to use them and all. In fact, all the royalties for this book go to a foundation for servant leadership that which we've created, you know, to kind of help fund projects that are trying to push this. And so it's just a it's just been an amazing thing. And, and I have both spiritual people and secular types and all that. But uh, John Maxwell, you know, who is a, was a former pastor and is a great person, I got John to write the uh, forward. And I said to John, who should we get to uh, endorse the book? He said, Ken, they're all in the book. And so if you open the book, the first three and a half pages just lists all the contributors, you know, and, you know, you got the Marshall Goldsmiths and Patrick Lencioni's and Francis Hesselbaum and Laurie Beth Jones and Dave Ramsey and, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Brene Brown and, and Simon Sinek. And, you know, I'm just I'm just blown away by the group that all participated in this and uh when i sent this to steve parasante who was the, the founder and the president of barrett kohler to get his response because most people don't like readings books and i don't normally either because the articles are too long and so all these articles here are like six or seven pages so you can read them and get get a good thought and now you're on to something else and I said, Steve, what do you think of this? And he called me back in two days. He said, Ken, this isn't a book. This is a movement. And, uh, you know, you know, Michael, we are so desperately need a different leadership role model. We've just seen in every sector of society the damage done by self-serving leaders who think it's all about them and all that kind of thing. And it's just wonderful to see turnarounds because of serving like take Rwanda where Rick Warren and uh, guys are but they were killing each other out there you know 15 20 years ago and they got a new leader and this is unbelievable turnaround in the country in fact they want to be the you know the new Singapore of of, uh, of South Africa and uh, so it's a so we just need it and so I'm so excited about this because this is the legacy I'd really like to leave you know is to, is to push this you know and and, uh, you know, Greenleaf is the modern guy, but the guy who started it all was Jesus, you know. I mean, how many of you got to wash the feet of your followers, you know? And, and it's interesting, you know, people will say to me, Michael, well, if I'm a servant leader, aren't I going to lo lo lose my position? I said, well, isn't it interesting? After Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he said, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, rightly so. But just as I have done for you, do for others. Even I have come to serve, not to be served. And uh, I, I just think we got to get that because we could solve so many problems in the world if we had a servant attitude. What is the biggest impediment to having that service attitude? Is it, is it fear? Is it not wanting to um, look strong? Well, what we found in our work, uh, Michael, is it's the human ego, and we call it edging God out. You can call it everything good outside if you, if you want, but uh, that's when you are focused on yourself, and there's two ways that your ego gets in the way. One is false pride, mm -hmm. when you think more of yourself than you should. And, you know, you think you're better, you're smarter than, and you, you know, people give you feedback and boom, you put them right back down, you know, and all that, because it's all about uh, you. And uh, the other one that, that gets your ego in the way a lot of people wouldn't have thought of was the ego problem is fear or self-doubt. Uh, because the problem is when you're fearful or doubt yourself, what do you do? You're focused on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I've started a 12-step Egos Anonymous program. <laughs> I use this in, in companies, you know, where I have people stand up and say, hi, I'm Ken, you know, and everybody will go, hi, Ken. And then I have to say, I'm an egomaniac. And then I say to them, you know, you got to tell me the last time in the last 48 hours when your ego got in the way, either with false pride, where you had a more than philosophy or fear of self-doubt, where you had a less than and if you can't think of something, you probably lie about other things, too, because, <laughs> you know, our ego all bites us periodically. But it's like any addiction. If we start to identify it, we can do something to stop it and maybe even apologize and, and all that kind of uh, thing. So uh, 
that's what, and the, and the thing that overcomes false pride is humility. Mm-hmm. And I remember when Jim Collins wrote Good to Great, and the two top characteristics were resolve, which is determination to, to solve a problem, live according to vision. And the second was humility. Initially, he told me, and I couldn't believe that that would be the second one. I told my researchers, keep on looking. And they kept, I'm sorry, Jim. He said, it is the second one, you know. Uh, and uh, because a lot of people think people with humility, that's a weakness. But I wrote a book with Norman Vincent Peale. What an amazing guy he was. He wrote The Power of Power. He was 86 years old when I met him. And in our book on the power of ethical management, we said, People with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. And so, you know, if you're humbled, you're, you're comfortable with yourself and you can permit other people in. And the over, way you overcome fear and self-doubt is to trust the unconditional love of God. God didn't make any junk. He absolutely loves us all. And we're all beautiful in our own way. And if we would stop putting ourselves down and realize that, hey, what are the special gifts I've been given? What are the special things I've been given. And so we try to help. And that's a big, a big uh, factor. So, so sort of like a 12 step program where, where in a sense you are giving it all up to a higher power, to God, to whatever we want to call it. If, if you get someone who stands up and says, hi, I'm Michael, I'm an egomaniac. What, what is step number one to help take them from fear and help them start walking that path toward love? Well, it's first admitting that they are an egomaniac. Second one, of course, in 12 step is to realize you can't do it yourself. You need the help of other people, uh, as well as, as the, the good Lord, you know, and, you know, help me get my ego out of the way, you know, and, and, uh, it's, you know, you almost go through the whole steps, including apologizing to some people where your ego might've been harmful to them and all that. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, concept. Uh, and I have some, uh, managers who, when they have their weekly meeting with their team, they always started off with an Egos Anonymous meeting. And they say, wow, that has brought them so close to each other. And a lot of people say, well, God, I don't want to admit those kind of things. You know, I mean, it'll, it'll show that I'm, you know, I'm vulnerable and all. And of course, it's Brene Brown is writing now vulnerability is a is about courage. It's really powerful. And Colleen Barrett from Southwest has a great saying. She said, people, uh, you know, admire your skills, but they love your vulnerability. And because the, your people already know you don't have all the answers. And so when you admit it, they go, wow, this is going to be fun. We're going to really get a chance to work together and contribute at all. They don't think less of you. They think more of you. That's huge. And when you admit your vulnerabilities, you admit your humanity, you are allowing them to feel safe to be human and vulnerable as well. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you say? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. What would you say are the top characteristics then of a servant leader? Well, Larry Spears has an article in the book because he ran the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership for years and probably is a top scholar of Greenleaf's thinking. And he talks about, you know, uh, first of all, listening, Mm -hmm. you know, empathy, you know, uh, you know, uh, a commitment to help others, you know, a sense of community, uh, you know, love rather than fear, you know, I mean, and, and so you can start to think of these uh, these characteristics that are just just so powerful and so important uh, that you you need to to just help you get out of your own way mm-hmm. and realize that you're not here uh, for yourself. You're here to help other people. In fact, I have a friend, uh, Owen Phelps, who uh, uh, is a kind of a Catholic theologian, and, and he said that this there's the three S model to servant leadership. Uh, the the first S is, is servant, and the, the elevator speech there, it's not about you. The second one is uh, the uh, steward, and the elevator stu- speech there is you don't own a thing. <laughs> you don't own your people. You don't own your resources. You don't own the building. Everything's on loan. How are you stewarding it? Stewarding it? And the last is the shepherd, and the elevator speech for that is every human being is important. Uh, and I think uh, those are just mindsets that are just important for us to get. That's why we think uh, 
Servant leadership starts in the inside. It's a heart issue first. It's a character issue. Answering that question, are you here to serve or be served? I think that is so huge because when, when I look at the challenges of the world and, and people write in, call in, we have a show where they can actually uh, uh, call in on our Facebook Live or YouTube Live, and they're saying, how do we fix this in the world? How do we fix that in the world? And I'm like, you got to go to the inside first. The outside is just a reflection of what's going on on the inside. Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest questions I get and we talk about, in fact, my wife Margie has a wonderful article in here about uh, the servant follower, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, is how do I become a servant leader in an organization where the top people aren't buying into it? And I, I say that to them, and Margie says in their article, is that you remember you got personal power and position power. Mm -hmm. And if you're down the hierarchy, you don't have any position power. So don't charge in and start to criticize people because they'll throw you out of their office. You know, you first have to develop a relationship with people before you can give them any feedback that they might listen to, you know, because to me, human relations is like money in the bank, you know, and anytime you give somebody feedback about what they're doing, I don't care how good you're doing it, Michael, is you're going to draw something from your bank account, your human relations. If there's nothing in the bank, <laughs> you got nothing to draw about. I tell a story. I was working in one college of business, and, and the dean wrote a lot about participative management and all, but he didn't do it, you know. And he was just driving faculty crazy, and they would charge him to his office and tell him what he was doing. He would throw him out, you know. So I said, I got to get a relationship with this guy first. And he was a good writer, and I was just getting going in my writing career. And so I stopped him in the hall, and I said, George, uh, I'm working on an article for a publication. Would you be willing to look at it and give me some feedback? Oh, absolutely. You know, and I went into his office, and he had flip charts up there, and he told me. So we had about two or three sessions on some of my writing projects. Mm -hmm. And the third one, he said, Ken, what are we going to do with all the jerks we have in this school? And the big thing was he said, what are we going to do? I mean, I was on his team, and now I could not only tell him what th I things they could do, but some things that he could do that, to make things differently. So that's where you're being kind of a servant follower, helping the leader accomplish the goals that they want. And you did it in a very kind and compassionate and open-hearted manner. That's right, yes. Yeah. So yeah. going to an article by, by Brene Brown in the book, how do we recognize and combat shame then? Well, you know, see, a lot of times that because the, the self-serving organization, you know, I mean, if you're not going along with the policy and all, you know, shame on you, you know, I mean, I, I've heard that, that word and all. And, and what she's really saying is, you know, we got to get rid of uh, that. And, and, and the servant leadership philosophy is, is you build people up, you don't tear them down, you know, and the big question for servant leaders is how do I help, mm -hmm. you know, and all. And so <clears throat> she says that it really takes courage, you know, to, to be vulnerable and to all reach out to people. But what we need is that positive courage out there to, to make that kind of difference. Because we, we if people are running around with shame, you know, the minute you feel shame, the body language, you know, you're squished over and all. Where if, if people are saying, you know, hey, you're part of the team, I want, you know, and your shoulders go back, you know, and you just have a whole different thing. I heard a session the other night from our doctor, uh, Lee Rice, uh, mm -hmm. on the power of, of attitude in terms of health, in terms of keeping diseases away from you or, you know, getting well when you get sick and all that. You know, if you got a positive attitude and all and, it, and it's a choice. It really is a choice. I mean, being a servant leader is a choice. Woohoo! So, <laughs> in fact, maybe we should go there. The importance of celebrating. Yes. Well, we have a wonderful article on uh, that by a, a, a great coach. And, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, to me, the key thing is catching people doing things right and mm -hmm. celebrating their their victories and all. And so we, we do a lot of that in our company and I do it on my morning messages. And we have a lot of uh, celebration times. We just, uh, this, this uh, week, uh, suddenly we, we got a big contract with the, uh, in Washington and, and uh, we had the uh, uh, 
beginning of the publication of this book efficiently and all. So we had Taco Tuesday, you know, and last minute we had, we have 165 people on our local site and they, we had bought a taco wagon and we celebrated the book and we celebrated the, the new sale. And we also elect a mayor every year for the, for the company, you know, who's a really a character usually that thinks of fun things to do and to celebrate and all. And it was, you know, people said, God, that's just great about this Taco Tuesday. Oh, let's go, you know. And uh, we just don't do enough celebrating. You know, I mean, I, I mean, that's that's one of my concerns about uh, the press personally. You know, I I don't think we have enough good news stories that get celebrated. We, we hear all the bad news uh, all the time. So I, I really don't uh, watch the news very much anymore, you know, because it's just kind of depressing. But I know people are doing good things. I, I gave a, a major speech at uh, First Tee, where they teach young people in, in tough areas uh, character traits through golf. Hmm. And they've, they've worked with 10 million students. And I said, how come I haven't heard more about this? You know, 10, 10 million kids have gone through that. You should have heard the testimonies from these young kids of what a difference it's made in their lives. You know, so we got to got to celebrate. Woohoo! And, <laughs> and not judge, but to love. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Judge not, or we shall be judged. Let's let's go from there. In fact, there was a great a great piece by Chris Hodges in there about uh, not judging because you're not walking in somebody else's shoes. Yes, it's really you know, and he had this kid who was a real problem in a, in a meeting that he was leading at the at his church, you know, and he said, "I want to see that kid." after the meeting and so gets the kid in his office he says what's your story and the kid took his shirt off and turned his back and he had all these welts from obviously being beaten and whipped and all and he said wow he said you know you can't you got to know people's story don't make these biggest judgments and certain things about people it's really a powerful stuff so let's let's go from there. And there are so many brilliant stories and and articles in this book. But let's go to one that you wrote now, which is Jesus is the greatest example of servant leader. Well, it's uh, it was really interesting. I I came to my faith late in in life, but the big motivator was when the one minute manager came out. It was so ridiculously successful. I was having trouble taking credit for it, and so people started to ask me. Ken, why do you think it was so successful? I don't know why. So I said, I don't know. God must be involved. My mother was praying for me. But all of a sudden, you know, because I'm mentioning God, you know, he starts sending all these people. So I'm on the hour of power with Robert Schuler, you know, and he said, Ken, I love the one minute manager, but you know, he's the one greatest one minute manager of all time. He said, Jesus. I said, really? You know, and he started to tell me how he did. And I went, whoa, that's really interesting. You know, and then I get a call would I write a book with Norman Vincent Peale? And I said, is he still alive? I mean, my parents had gone to his church before I was born. And uh, he was just an amazing guy. And he said, Ken, the Lord's always had you on his team. You just haven't suited up yet, you know? And so when I finally went and started to read the Gospels, I just started to laugh, Michael, because everything I had ever written about leadership was there. I mean, Jesus was a situational leader, you know, in terms of we have situational leadership, too, which is our theory that we use in our company. And it was about different strokes for different folks as their development level changed. And you watch when he sent the disciples out for the first commission, there's a page and a half of directive behavior because what? They were enthusiastic beginners. He told them what to do, how to do it. When, and you see him gradually change his leadership style. So the end of Matthew, what does he do? He delegates. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. And that's basically all the instructions, you know, baptize them in the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. But, um, and then he was a one minute manager and all. And so what Phil Hodges and I, he's an old buddy of mine, and he was one of the guys that first pointed me towards the, the Lord, uh, found out that nobody was teaching anything about Jesus as a great leader in the churches or the divinity schools and all. So we said, I guess we better do that. And, uh, we're now all around the world and people are just going blown away because, you know, uh, John Ortberg was on, he and I were doing something in Atlanta and he's a pastor friend of mine from Northern California, a great writer and all. And I said, John, why would you fly across America to tell people that Jesus is the greatest servant leader of all time? And John's a great storyteller. He turns to this crowd, we had a couple of thousand in his church and we were broadcasting all over the country. 
And he said, well, suppose you all were gamblers, you know, 22, 2300 years ago. I know some of you don't like gambling, but just, you know, amuse me. Where would you have bet your money on lasting? The Roman Empire and the Roman army or a little Jewish rabbi with 12 incompetent, inexperienced followers? He said, isn't it interesting that 2100 years later, we're still naming kids Jesus, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and we name our dogs Nero and Caesar. <laughs> I risk my case. And so... Um, uh, it's really powerful uh, uh, to see that. And I think we're impacting a lot of people's lives by having them look at Jesus as a, as a leader uh, and realizing not only as a spiritual leader, but he was a, a leader of people. Woohoo! So let's let's talk uh, talk real briefly about some of the key concepts there. First off, what was management by wandering around? Well, management by wandering around was a concept that Tom Peters talked about, but I <laughs> heard from Robert Shula. He said, you and Tom didn't invent that concept. He said, Jesus did. He wandered from one little village to another village. If anybody showed any interest, he'd praise him, he'd heal him. He said, isn't that your second secret one? Remember? Yeah, you know, and so... Uh, but management of wandering around is getting out of your office, you know, and Jesus didn't even have an office, you know. <laughs> He's just out there with the with the people. And so often I think what happens to these hierarchies with egocentric people is that they, they stay in their office and all. I mean, I've had some top managers, I've made them board the bathroom in their office, you know, <laughs> because I said, if you at least got to go to the bathroom outside your office, you might see it, you might run into somebody, you know. <laughs> and, and another one of these concepts, then anyone who wants to be first must be last. Well, I think that's really uh, true, that if, if you really want to create great results and great human satisfaction, if you get yourself out of the way and build other people up, uh, they're going to take you along for the ride, you know, <laughs> because this, as uh, uh, John Maxwell says in the introduction we put in the back of the book, the only way to create great relationships and results is through servant leadership. It's all about putting other people first. And boy, that's a powerful uh, thing, and I think that's where the, the thing they bring you to bring you along. I love John in here says he always gets uh, gets a kick out of people uh, saying, you know, that uh, you know the, it's lonely at the top. And he said, if it's lonely at the top, he said, get that's just because nobody's following you. <laughs> what you ought to do is get out of your office and go down where they are and bring them to the top. I think that's a wonderful concept of John's. And it sounds like a way that you've lived. Yes, it really is, is key, I think. And I've been blessed to be married to Margie for 55 years, and I know you have a happy marriage. The, 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 the best marriages I've seen, are, Michael, is when the, the man realizes that he married above himself. <laughs> <laughs> so Margie and I went back to our 55th reunion, and people were still coming up to me, guys I knew for you. How did you ever talk Margie into marrying you? You know, Because she, she was a star, you know. <laughs> Thank you. I still look at Jessica to this day, and, and I look at her and I go, why'd you choose me? Of all people, me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. What, is a, uh, what in the world are fishers of men? Well, I think it's really a, an opportunity to go out there to make a difference in other people's lives. That's really what the business we should all be in. No matter, quote, what our business is, the big question is, are you making a difference you know, and uh, are you creating them so that these were fishermen? He says, yeah, but I'm going to help you now be fishers of lives, you know, and make a difference in people's lives. What a, what a great concept that is. Thank you. And then transitioning from, from Jesus, let's talk about Martin Luther King real briefly in servant yeah. leadership. Yeah, well, there's a wonderful article in here about Andrew Young being a servant leader to Martin Luther King Jr., you know, and uh, it's just uh, it's just amazing because everything he did was to help Martin uh, make a difference uh, out there, and and uh, it's it's just a it's a wonderful thing, and and so it wasn't about Andrew; it was about how he could support uh, his leader who he wanted to take, and and of course, this has he had a great career now himself. He's had a wonderful career. 
Thank you. Going back, doubling back, what would you say is one of the most important lessons you learned from Norman Vincent Peale? Well, the biggest lesson I learned from, from Norman is the whole idea of, of positive thinking, as of making a difference in other people's uh, lives. And uh, he was just an amazing person. Also, you know, uh, he was a guy who didn't feel he had to be right about his religion. I think that's one of the problems where people want to be right, you know, and all. And you're kind of taking God's job. But I remember one time I said to Norman, I said, Norman, do you believe Jesus is the truth in the way? He said, absolutely. I said, what about the millions of people in the world who'd never heard of Jesus? Are they going to go to hell? What about the good people that heard about him who decided not to follow him? I had a Jewish friend killed in 9-11. He never had a mean thought in his life. What about them? And Norman said, I believe in a loving God. He said, I bet he handles that in a loving way. He said, I'm in sales, not management. And I just love that, you know, I'm in sales. So I'm in sales, not management. My, not my job, and I think that's why I got people to cooperate on this book, is that, that we're in sales, not management. I'm not judging them. I'm supporting them. And everything we're doing here is to support their ministries, their callings too. Woohoo! You have a beautiful line in the book. Life is about helping people get A's. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, that came from uh, uh, Gary Ridge, who was the president of WD-40. And not, we have a master's degree program in leadership at the University of San Diego. And my wife and I teach a course on leadership point of view. And I was telling him, in my 10 years of teaching, Michael, I... I uh, always gave out the final exam the first day of class. And a lot of the faculty would say, what are you doing? I, I say, I'm confused. They say, act. I said, I thought we were supposed to teach these kids. You are, but don't give them the questions in the final. And I'd say, not only am I going to give them the questions in the final, what do you think I'm going to do all semester? I'm going to teach them the answers. So when they get to the final exam, they get A. Life's about getting A. is not some stupid normal distribution curve. And in so many organizations, they're asking managers to screw a certain percentage of their people you know, with this normal distribution evaluation system. And I'll go into these organizations. i say, how many of you go out and hire losers? You know, you lost some of your worst people last year. You want to hire some new losers to fill the low slots. No, you either go out and hire winners you steal from other companies or potential winners. And why don't you want people to win? And Gary said, boy, why don't we do that in industry? And he started a whole thing at WD-40. Don't mark my paper. Help me get an A. And he requires all of his managers to help people accomplish their goals. And and it's just created. Last time they took it, he has a 92% uh, employee work passions in their company, 92%. And uh, they uh, their growth since he's been president is from $300 million to I don't know how over well over a billion and all that. So they're getting great results and great human satisfaction. They have a survey that they send out every year. In the latest survey, 98% of the people all over the world, they were in 60 nations, filled out the survey, self-survey about WD-40. The highest rated question was 98.5 people said, I'm proud to tell people I work for WD-40. I went, whoa. <laughs> Isn't that something? Which in That's today's all about world. serving leadership. Yep. And in today's world of, of huge job dissatisfaction and jumping from job to job to job, that is, is it's flipped the whole trend on its head. Yes. No, it's a, it really is. The, the number of people who are dissatisfied at work is, you know, in some version, it's not like 60, 70 percent of the people out there. And that's costly when you use, lose people. And I want to tell you, if you will take care of people, the people will take care of you and they'll want to stay and all. Cheryl Batchelor, who turned around Popeyes, you know, with servant leadership, you know, realized, hey, the franchisees, they're the ones that make our business. How can I help them? You know, and all that kind of thing. And so people, rather than leaving, said, how do I get part of this organization and all that kind of thing? Because people want to be in an organization that's positive. They want to be in an organization where they can contribute. They want to be in an organization where they can cheer people on and they get cheered on. Woohoo! <laughs> What's the importance of compassion in this? Well, compassion is, is really important, which is to try to uh, see where other people are in their 
uh, and their sister, Greg Rochelle, who has a big church in Oklahoma, wrote a wonderful article in the book about that. He's driving home and he's late, and there's a woman in this country road standing there, and he's saying, oh, I should stop and all, but I'm late for, and he ends up speeding by, and he went, wow. He said, that's not, that, that's, that wasn't a very good thing. And it really has bothered him a long time because, you know, Jesus would be going off to by himself, and he, crowds would follow him and always said he had compassion for them. And so he he stopped and spoke to them and taught them. And and so compassion is to, to be there where other people are. Uh, it's such an important trait, I think, and it's a key for servant leadership. Thank you. You you wind down the book by saying it's the power of love rather than the love of power. Yes, I, I think that what happens in organizations that are self-serving and want to keep that traditional pyramid is it's all about power and, and love power. I'm in charge and I got promoted up here and all. But when you're a servant leader and after the vision and direction and values and all are clear and you turn this thing up, now it's a power of love. How can you love on, empower, train, cheer your people on so what they can accomplish their goals and eventually take care of your customers? And so it's a, it's such a powerful uh, thing, you know. And it's interesting uh, that uh, we mentioned earlier about the happy marriages or when the husband thinks they married above themselves. And, you know, you talk to some people who have had three or four marriages and you say, well, what's your image of marriage? Well, the man should be in charge. Come on, get a life, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's supposed to be about love, not about power. So, If the mama ain't happy, ain't That's nobody right. happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's really true. So, Ken, if so. I took off my coaching hat today and I put it on you – what one homework assignment, I don't want people listening to this interview without taking action. What one homework assignment would you give people to help them step forward into their own leadership role more open hearted today? Well, one of the things I would do is I would plan a strategy to enter your day slowly. You know, and Norman Vincent Peale's in my book. We talked about we have two selves. We have a task-oriented self to used to getting jobs and then a thoughtful, reflective. Which one wakes up quicker in the morning? The task-oriented, the alarm goes off, and boom, you're out of bed, you know, and you're starting to eat while you're washing, you know, and you jump in your car, you got your cell phone, you're running around and all that, you know, and you're caught in a rat race. And I love Lily Talman, the great Hollywood philosopher. She said the problem with a rat race is even if you win it, you're still a rat. And so one of the things I think we need is to start our day slowly uh, with our thoughtful, reflective self. And first of all, one of the things I like to do is think about what am I doing today mm -hmm. and how do I want to be today so that I can be the servant that I want to be and all. And so I kind of vision the day and vision how I want to be and all. And then, you know, I've never been a, uh, a journal writer, you know, because I have friends that write journals with poetry and four colors and all, but uh, Bill Hybels from Willow Creek is an old buddy of my wonderful church in Chicago. He was the, the uh, uh, chaplain for the Chicago Bears at one time when Singletary was there. And, and after Bible study, he would stay for a while and they would watch the game films and talk about what they did well. Mm -hmm. They want to keep on doing it, what they didn't. And so, boom, he called me and said, Blanchard, I finally discovered what I should do. And this has helped me a lot, is at the end of the day, get a journal out and write praisings. And what did you do today that's consistent with who you want to be in the world? And pat yourself on the back on it. And then redirections, which is, what did you do today? You wish you could have an instant replay that you do it. And if I tell you, if you track your praisings and redirections on a daily basis, you'll start to be the person that you want to be because so often we get sidetracked. So that's my big lesson. Enter your day slowly. So many points out of that. And, and I, I teach people automatic writing and a journaling process and a centering process in the morning and teach them a, a daily wins at the end of the day. I love what you're sharing here with the praise because then you are going to end your day on a positive note, no matter what happened, and we never finish our to-do list. There is, it's impossible. So if you end by going to praise, 
then through the night, your subconscious is someplace positive, helping set you up for success. So the more, next morning, you're not waking up in dread and fear, but instead a little bit more of a place of woohoo. Yes. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So yeah. Oh. what what advice would you give? Okay, I, I got I, I actually I was going to ask what advice, but first off, what's been your secret? Well, you know, I I I get a kick out of a uh, Marshall Goldsmith, who's a good buddy and wrote a great article in here. He interviewed Frances Hesselbaum recently, and she's the head of the Girl Scouts at, at one point and ran the Drucker Center, and she's. You know, she doesn't like to talk about her age, but she's 101. And he said, Francis, what's your key to success in life? And she said, it's my blood type. I said, blood type, what's that? She said, be positive. And I think that's why you and I, I think we could go on for five hours in this show rather than a, in an hour. Because when you're dealing with somebody who's positive and there's both of you are positive, you start building on each other. And, and one thing, oh, yeah, you know. And so I, I think, and, and my mother she was great. She was a big positive thinker. And she said, Ken, don't you act like you're better than anybody else. But don't let them act like they're better than you. God didn't make any junk. We're all beautiful. You know, be positive, you know. <laughs> Woohoo! What <laughs> advice would you give kids today, or excuse me, parents? This is what Jessica always wants me to ask. What advice would you give parents to help their kids today? And thank you, Mom. Well, I tell you, we're trying to work with schools now, too, and it's the same advice that we give in parents. And our theme is you need to connect before you correct, you know, and that if you really want to help build somebody up and get them in the right direction, you first have to connect with them and love on them and have them know that you care. And so often we end up disciplining right away and all this kind of thing rather than taking the time to build that relationship. So, you you know, I mean, my mother and father used to say, this hurts me more than, than you'll know if they're giving me a spanking or something for something. <laughs> I did, but I knew, I knew they loved me, you know. And uh, so I think I, I just love that uh, line, that you need to connect before you correct. And, and that's what I would say to you, you as parents and all. That does not mean that you let your kids get away with all kinds of things. No, because you want to you take care of me. A river without banks is a large puddle. You know, the, what lets the river flow is the banks. And so as a parent, you want to set some banks and perimeters. That's why I think you need family mission statement. You need family values, you know, all those kinds of things to set those banks. But it's built on first a loving, loving relationship. And thank you. And we all need to have a mission statement and values, or we also are a river without banks and become puddles ourselves. Yes. Mm-hmm. And my mission statement is to be a loving teacher and example of simple truths that helps myself and others to awaken to the presence of God in our lives so we realize we're here to serve, not to be served. And my values are spiritual peace, integrity, love, and joy. Woohoo! On that note, <laughs> what brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? I think the biggest happiness for me is that uh, we now have had our company for almost 40 years and our kids are playing major roles in our company and Margie's brother. In fact, we have a family council that runs the, the company, the five of us, and then we've recently added Scott's wife, Madeline, who heads up our coaching business. And to have our son heads up our product development area and does a lot of stuff. Our daughter heads up marketing. Uh, Margie's brother was born when she was a freshman at Cornell. Uh, he's our CEO and and all. And uh, so uh, I think the proudest is that we not only work together, but we play together. We're all going in, in the end of May where we're all taking our kids and everybody to Alaska for a week together. We do family trips and we spend the summer together in upstate New York on Skinny Atlas Lake and all. And so I think that's the proudest I am. Is it? People kid my wife, Margie, and she said, why do you keep going to the office at your age? You know, And she says, because everybody I love in the world is there and I don't have to invite them because <laughs> you know, her best friends and family are all there. So I'm proud of that. And we were chosen the number one company uh, in, in the uh, middle-sized businesses in San Diego. 
and to show that, you know, we're, we're walking our talk. I'm proud of that. And you're doing it out of love. It's all out yeah. of love. Woohoo! So yeah. where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book? Well, we have a website called KenBlanchardBooks.com. Mm -hmm. But you can also go to Amazon, you know, Barnes & Noble and, and order it. And if you like it, I'd love to invite you to be car part of the movement. you got to share the word, not to sell the book per se, although the money is going to go to a foundation, all, but to spread the word that we're really here on earth to make a difference in other people's lives. It's not about us. Uh, and if you part of the movement, maybe we can make a difference in the world. And that's what I hope about all of these wonderful contributors here helping us get the good word out. And you all can be the same because we need you. <laughs> so for people who didn't catch that, come on over to KenBlanchardBooks.com. And if you can't remember KenBlanchardBooks.com, come on over to InspireNationShow.com. And we'll get you over to KenBlanchardBooks.com. Ken, this has been truly phenomenal. Before we have you do a, a, a brief prayer at the end, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? Well, I, I just think that life is a very special occasion. Uh, don't miss it, you know, and you miss it by having your head down and moaning and groaning and all. You need to constantly keep that head up and, and saying, OK, you know, that's an issue I got to deal with and all. But how can I make a difference in the world? Woohoo! Yeah. So would you have time for a brief prayer of your calling? Sure. Yes. Oh, Lord, thank you for creating this incredible world. And we certainly need your help today as we look around the world and we hear all these bad news stories and all. Uh, we can make a difference. We can change it around, but we need your help. We can't do it alone. And so stay with us and, and help us reach out to you in love and realize that love is the answer. What is the question? And if we have that attitude and we have your help, we can make a difference in the world. And thank you, Lord, for Michael and the positive difference he is making in his family and his wife and his kids and all. And take care of them. We need that positive energy. And same with my family and all of your families. Bless you. And thank you for everything. God bless. God bless. Amen. Thank you so, so much, Ken. This has been truly phenomenal. Love the work you're doing support you, support you, support you so much. Love your mission. Well, thank you, Sam. And any help I can be to you in the future, let me know. Absolutely, will do. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get servant leadership in action, and begin leading with your heart today and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. Well, good. What a joy this was to talk to you. It's like being talking to a friend. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>